Hi everybody, hope you're well. Today I'll read from a book titled PC, Round Earth, uh, Tradition and Potential, edited by Roger Bolhauser, Nadia Maillard and Cyril Veillon, and published by Trieste. Jesus Vassalo wrote, The emergence of a new construction technology is always an exciting moment for architecture. Despite the way in which we tend to think about technologies as products handed down to us, finished and ready to use, the truth is that in order to be fully absorbed and deployed, any material first needs to undergo a slow and complex process of technical and cultural construction. This process likens a collective conversation, in which the different stakeholders, material engineers, industrialists, architects and clients actively test the perceived potentials of a material against the limits of what is physically and economically viable, but also culturally acceptable and desirable. This is of course nothing new. The first iron bridges imitated stone ones, and it was only eventually that the forms that we now envision as inevitable for that structural type were distilled. A similar thing could be said about concrete, which was first coveted by 19th century architects for its capacity to render ornamental detail, and only gradually realized into the revolutionary material of the 20th century through the successive breakthroughs of figures such as François Nebic and Le Corbusier. Even more recently, mass timber construction, which was initially devised as a substitute for prefabricated concrete panel construction, has started to come into its own and is already hinting at a large-scale transformation of the construction industry. The case of earth construction is even more complex for several reasons, nonetheless because it is not strictly a new material, nor a new application of an existing material. Earth construction was a staple of popular construction until a century and a half ago, when it was abruptly discontinued in industrialized nations, leaving us in the awkward position of figuring out whether we should try to pick up where our forebearers left and make up for the lost time, as implied by the structure of this book, or try and reconceptualize the material from scratch in a more abstract way, assuming that is even possible. Additionally, and as opposed to the case of wood where cross-lamination technology was developed quietly and only later realized as having a revolutionary potential, in the case of earth construction, the technical, formal and cultural threads of the conversation about the material are happening simultaneously and under public scrutiny. This book is then a case in point, in that it offers precise and specific examples of how such a conversation about a new material unfolds. Here we find, for instance, positions that argue for the adequacy of the introduction of cement in small proportions in order to stabilize the new earth construction and bring it up to industrial production standards, as opposed to other positions that defend the necessity to remain within the pure material definition and lower energy footprint of traditional buildings, not to mention the possibility in the near future of fully different applications of the material such as poured loam enabled by new types of non-cementitious additives which would altogether redefine the parameters of the conversation. It is important then to understand that these are not purely technical problems and cannot be figured out according to purely positivistic parameters. In the end, the problems at hand are so complex that value judgments have to be made and preference has to be given to certain issues above others in order to resolve conflictive claims regarding cost, scale of production, structural performance, durability and energy consumption, just to name some of the pressures placed on the material. It is then precisely because of the urgency and simultaneity of these demands and the impossibility to resolve them synthetically according to a mathematical formula that the project of the nascent contemporary earth construction has to be defined as a deeply political problem. In that regard, and in order to understand the political implications at stake, it is useful to be reminded of the larger context out of which the interest in earth construction represented in this book has emerged. 
Faced with the recursive climate-induced disasters and ongoing mass extinction and other indicators of planetary collapse, such as a melting Arctic or floating plastic islands the size of large countries, we are just recently coming to terms with the sobering reality that the only way to guarantee the continuity of human life on Earth is to enact a dramatic change of course regarding our modes of production and consumption. When it comes to a political questioning of the material problem posed in this book, then, the issue of scale, both literally and in terms of economics, comes to the foreground. One first observation in that regard would be that the option of a radical retreat to a utopia of self-sufficiency is beside the point here. That there are not enough of the grid mud cabins in the world to fix the types of problems that we are facing. And that the righteousness of the hermit or the communers who desert society to establish a perfect and miniaturized Arcadia would not in any way help the rest of us stop or counter the deterioration processes described above. On the other hand, it should also be said firmly that no measure of trust can be placed in the market either, since the capacity of our economic system to absorb, neutralize and commoditize anything that stands in the way of profit margins is unbounded. It is easy to visualize this condition if we think of how early disruptive efforts to introduce ecologic concerns and sustainability into the conversations about cities and buildings have resulted largely in a wave of greenwashing and how architects, through their capacity to package and sell ideas through images, have been active enablers of the banalization and commercialization of ecological construction. Even with a recent development like uh, mass timber construction, one can already start to see the beginning of a yellow washing phenomenon taking hold of architectural renderings across publications. While the cultural connotations of Earth as a poor material make it less desirable from a commercial perspective, its gradual fetishization and commodification as an aesthetic veneer should not be discounted. One has to wonder then what the options are for architects and other practitioners if full-on resistance is futile and the inertia of the market is taking us directly towards the cliff at increasing speed. The answer necessarily goes through a re-evaluation of the pockets of agency left within architectural practice. A prevailing complaint of the profession of architecture has to do with the diminished role that we play within the larger economic and political forces that shape cities. In fact, by the time we come on board a given project, most likely the biggest decisions uh, as to what, where and when to build have already been made. But this is not to say, however, that the more technical and disciplinary tasks uh, which make up uh, the core of our daily routine as practitioners are devoid of impact. And those are precisely the ones that we must leverage in order to become a positive force of change. Among the areas of technical expertise that grant the architect a certain authority, the specification of construction materials and processes is perhaps the larger lever of economic, social and environmental agency that we have in our toolbox. It is precisely through that channel that Earth offers the possibility to incorporate or grant some of the strategies of resistance and self-reliance of the hermit into the mechanisms of contemporary industrial construction, in what in effect would suppose a mediation between the two extreme positions laid out above. This approach is perhaps what Michel de Certeau would describe as an antidisciplinary attitude, one that subverts some of the aspects of daily practice and reimagines them as tools of political agency. It is not difficult to imagine the deep impact that a sudden change in prescription practices would have in the construction industry if architects concertedly decided to ban or give preference to certain products or ways of building. Seen through that political lens, earth construction is especially relevant in that it touches in a very pure and concentrated way into the questions of material and labor. On the one hand, earth is not a product, but a raw material, and one which is usually found at the site, or could actually be claimed to be the site itself. 
If taken to an extreme, this way to conceptualize Earth construction would infer a way of operating that imagines construction as a practice of transformation or metamorphosis. A series of immaterial actions are enacted on the material of the site that produce its transformation into the project, without DuPont or other intermediaries necessarily turning a profit in the process. On the other hand, earth construction is very labor-intensive. In fact, as inferred above, it is labor that does the work of taking the raw material all the way into finished construction. In a time such as ours, where artificial intelligence and automation seem to be placing us at the verge of yet another industrial revolution, contemporary earth construction confronts us squarely and directly with the question of who and how should be making our buildings in the future. Again, architects could and should have a saying in this matter all of which call for an expanded and renewed material literacy, one that takes into account both technical and cultural factors as well as the social and political implications of our decisions as they make their way down the chain of command of the construction process. Seen from a broader perspective, the contemporary reintroduction of earth construction can be understood as indicative of an even larger transformation within the field of architecture, namely the reconceptualization of the relationship between nature and culture. Architecture's traditional relation to nature has been through mimesis, meaning that natural forms are imitated with artificial materials, either at the level of detail, as in the acanthus leaves of the Corinthian capital, or at the scale of the building, as in the animal metaphors of parametric architecture. What much of the contemporary material contained in this book proposes in change is then nothing less than the possibility of a new model for a relationship between architecture and nature, one where abstract cultural forms are transfigured in the flesh of natural materials. At best, and taken to its full conclusion, this new attitude would be indicative of the dissolution of the dichotomy between the artificial and the natural that has underwritten much of our predatory attitudes towards the environment. Only if we are able to understand ourselves and our production as part of nature may we find a way out of the Gordian knot that we so willfully and persistently have made for ourselves. This new way to think about construction, within which Earth uh, plays a central role, has already opened up uh, new possibilities for architecture. One of them is the weakening of the market-driven functionalist segregation, by which different materials specialize to fulfill different functions, whether structural, climatic or otherwise. Another one of perhaps uh, larger spatial implications is the possibility to redefine our idea of efficiency, whereby massiveness may be once again understood as generosity instead of redundancy. It is here perhaps that the role of architectural education is foregrounded. Sheltered from the urgency of everyday practice, academia is a space of investigation and insight, one where these new ideas can be tested and expanded, and the architects of the future educated in their relevance. Good examples of the opportunities and responsibilities afforded by the slower pace of the university can be found in these pages, in which true innovation is being driven by the shared energy of professors and students. While the future of Earth construction is still to come, and it is a promising one, its study is already contributing to reconceptualizing construction in our age of climatic emergency, and its practice is producing new ideas about space making that can already be ascertained and verified in contemporary architectural production in Europe and beyond. Regarded together and in perspective, they start to sketch out the emergence of a new architectural paradigm. Let that be a note on the potential of MAD. The photographs in the book are by Philip Heckhausen. The publication, which is available also in French and German, follows the exhibition Pisse, Tradition un Potential at EPFL Lausanne. As for the book at your local bookstore, thank you very much for watching this video and see you in the next one. Bye.